Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on Civil Rights Movement Freedom Songs. My name is Sarah Speltz and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Boston University Alumni Association and is offered as part of our Alumni Education Program. Many of our educational programs are held on campus, but we offer educational webinars because we want to connect with our alumni around the globe. And we do have alumni joining us today from China, France, and Great Britain, as well as many places in the US, including Washington, Indiana, Kansas, Florida, Illinois, Georgia, and of course, New England. Before I introduce today's speaker, a few housekeeping notes. This webinar is being hosted on our Zoom online meeting platform. If you experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of the presentation, please contact Zoom support. And I'm gonna give you the phone number right now if you'd like to write it down. It's 1-888-799-9666. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for on-demand viewing on our website, bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is eager to answer your questions and you are welcome to submit them anytime through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you just hover over the Q&A icon, you'll see you can click on that and answer your questions. So we'll get to those at the end, but you can submit them anytime. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Presenting today from the BU campus in Boston is Dr. Cheryl Boots. She is a triple terrier with three degrees from BU. She is also senior lecturer in the humanities in BU's College of General Studies, where she teaches advanced courses in American history and American literature, and maintains close contact with the BU American and New England Studies program. Her research interests include 19th century American literature, art, religion, and music in historical context, sacred music in the secular world, songwriting and performance, community development through singing, and the Southern Freedom Movement in the US. She is actually working on a book right now, so today's presentation is a bit of a sneak peek. Cheryl, thank you so much again for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks to you and Dan for all your help to make this possible today. Let's start with some music. I want to begin with contemporary singer-songwriter Reggie Harris, who is singing the Freedom Movement song, Been Down Into the South. Well, I've never been to heaven, but I think I'm right. Been down into the south. Folks up there, both black and white. Been down into the south. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Hallelujah, freedom. Been down into the south. Well, I've never been to heaven, but I think I'm right. Been down into the south. I don't want to go without my civil rights. Let me sing Hallelujah Freedom Hallelujah Freedom Hallelujah Freedom Been down into the South Just a little sample of some more music that we're going to hear today. To those of you who have been down into the South, those of you who plan to go down into the South, those of you who are already in the South, welcome. This afternoon, we'll spend some time hearing stories and songs of the Southern Freedom Movement in three Alabama cities, Montgomery, Birmingham, and Selma. For about 40 minutes or so, I will share with you how music and singing together developed and maintained a sense of community during the Southern Freedom Movement. Once I'm done talking, and I will be doing a little singing, we'll have time for Q&A, as Sarah has already explained. And feel free whenever there's music playing to sing along. Dr. Earl Fluker, who will lead the BU tour next month, might well expand upon today's central theme, which is community. Community forms the bedrock, bedrock of his work and of mine. Martin Luther King Jr.'s activism focused on what he called the beloved community. He explained in his book, uh, Stride Toward Freedom, that love or agape, and I'm quoting here, is the only cement that can hold this broken community together. When I am commanded to love, he wrote, I am commanded to restore community, 
to resist injustice and to meet the needs of my brothers. This community is Dr. King's beloved community. You may have already picked up on some of my terminology. I use the term Southern Freedom Movement to emphasize not only equal voting rights, but also equal access to public facilities and fair employment in the South. Think of the Southern Freedom Movement as a subset of the overall civil rights movement. And you'll certainly hear both of these terms used today. You'll also hear acronyms. SNCC, SNCC, is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, one of the national freedom movement organizations at the time. Also the SCLC, Southern Christian Leadership Council, and the oldest of them all, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Before I talk more about singing in the Southern Movement, let's take a quick look at the opening song sung by Reggie Harris. And you've got the text up here on the screen. Been Down Into the South was actually adapted from a gospel song entitled Been Down Into the Sea. In 1961, SNCC Field Secretary Bob Zellner was riding in a car with other SNCC members driving from Baton Rouge, Louisiana to the SNCC headquarters in Atlanta. Quite a trek. Bob made up new lyrics, brought them to the others in the car, and they chimed in with their own verses. Later, Bob brought this song to the students in Talladega, Alabama, who were working with him to desegregate public facilities. The Talladega movement embraced this song as their own. They sang it often. And as is typical for freedom songs, people from other areas heard it, sang it, and added their own verses. And from there, the song took on a life of its own. Speaking of community, notice how the words in the first verse and the last verse emphasize the interracial community, both black and white, that exists in heaven and on earth. The two other verses also show the hard work of desegregation, walking picket lines, soliciting participation door to door, and even going to jail. Freedom Songs expressed a grassroots history of the movement, and that was one of its functions. Many people agree that the civil rights movement was the greatest singing movement this country has experienced. I've been intrigued by what actually happens when people sang freedom songs and how that worked to help desegregate large parts of America in the 1950s and the 1960s. The phrase cultural work refers to the way music expressed values and attitudes of the people who sang and who wrote these songs and also how these songs enabled oppressed people to envision and also live out an alternative social reality, in this case, a desegregated society. Today we'll look at four ways that Freedom Songs did this cultural work, and there's certainly more. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, <clears throat> singing Freedom Songs affirmed the humanity of African Americans. In Montgomery in 1955, bus drivers called African American riders, and I'm quoting here, black apes and, quote, black cows. This was reported by riders on the buses. In the South and North, many whites thought people of color were animals, as this indicates, or perhaps even lesser human beings. Freedom songs, however, confirmed African Americans are fully human beings. Second, Freedom Songs established the equality of people of all races through their lyrics and through the act of singing. The lyrics of Been Down Into the South, for example, as we've seen, refer to blacks and whites as equals together. Human equality supports the legitimacy of integration in all facets of American life and recognition of African Americans as American citizens with all the rights that are due to American citizens. Third, singing freedom songs expressed emotions common among all human beings. Some songs were funny. Some helped pass the time, especially while sitting in a jail cell or on a long, long car ride, say, from Baton Rouge to Atlanta. Other songs helped protesters face violent conditions on the streets with individual and collective courage. The song, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Round, is one example of resilience and determination in a song. 
Freedom songs also provided an outlet for other powerful feelings, including fear, anger, loneliness, and especially, according to Howard Thurman, freedom songs, songs of the slaves, now into the 20th century, expressed hope. Fourth, singing freedom songs created a community that crossed lines of race, age, religion, ethnicity, gender, and even region. When people sang together, they experienced what I call egalitarian resonance. Everyone contributed to the music. Whether they were talented soloists or Johnny One Notes, everybody sang. Producing music and also listening to music receptively, positively, or responsively creates that temporary collective connection and emotional high. Egalitarian through, through music became a temporary model for a longer lasting and larger community, the vision that Dr. Martin Luther King had for a beloved community. As we look at what happened in Montgomery, Birmingham, and Selma, we'll see how these cultural work functions play out in the music and in the act of singing together. The Montgomery Bus Boycott. Montgomery is the state capital. It sometimes has been called the cradle of the Confederacy. The first Confederate flag flew over the first Confederate government here in 1861. On December 5th, 1955, the Montgomery boy bus boycott began. Organizers hoped that they could stage a successful one day protest. In fact, Dr. King told his wife Coretta, if they could get 60% of the people to stay off the buses, he would feel very satisfied. The first day was so wildly successful with over 90% people staying off of the bus that the bus boycott continued for more than a year, as you can see until December 20th, 1956. And during that time, they called for changes, including integrated seating and employment of black bus drivers. Singing in the Montgomery movement. Because we now know that the Montgomery movement was successful, we might be tempted to assume that winning was a foregone conclusion. It was not. Many things arose during that year plus that, that threatened to make it not be successful. But the question is, what had changed in 1955 to make the bus boycott successful? We can't investigate all of the contributing factors, but we can affirm that there were multiple factors. Nevertheless, let's look at a few. First of all, Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954 meant that education was supposed to be desegregated. Why not transportation? And in fact, there were other uh, transportation uh, acts that, that pointed toward desegregating transportation. Mass meeting with, with singing led by charismatic leaders was certainly part of it. But before that, you have to see that there was an established network of NAACP activists. Um, Rosa Parks may have rather spontaneously decided not to change her seat, but she was no neophyte to the struggle. She'd been the secretary of the Montgomery NAACP. She hosted the NAACP youth meetings in her home. She had been um, to the Highlander Center, which was a training center, and a community organizing uh, location. So with the foundation built by the NAACP, Rosa Parks took the step to stay in her seat. The Montgomery Improvement Association that was developed to, to carry on the bus boycott took direct action, and that was different from what the NAACP tended to do. MIA was led by this charismatic young fellow, a preacher that just had graduated from Boston University. Who might that have been? Yes, Martin Luther King Jr. And so that was a significant part of the Montgomery bus movement. The format of these mass meetings followed a process quite similar to African American religious services with groups singing and praying individuals giving testimonies and inspirational 
leaders preaching, mass meetings formed the backbone of direct action in other Southern movement cities, as well as in Montgomery. And finally, fundraising efforts and events. With nearly 17,500 African-American bus riders in Montgomery, let me repeat that number, 17,500 bus riders who needed transportation. Movement leaders had to come up with income to cover the expenses of volunteer drivers. Movement supporters held Sunday afternoon teas with entertainment. And that's where we see three characters that are important to our story. Three girls, Jamila Jones, Gladys Carter, and Minnie Hendrix, attended elementary school together in 1955. They liked to sing spirituals. And so for the Friday afternoon talent shows at school, they performed together. Once the bus boycott began, the girls, as they were known, sang at the Sunday fundraiser keys also. Jamila said, looking back, we were carrying the message of the movement through our songs. They later had to come up with a name and decided that they would be known as the Montgomery Gospel Trio. Guy Carowin, who was the music director at the Highlander Center, had heard the Montgomery girls sing. He invited them to perform at a fundraiser held in Carnegie Hall in New York City. There they recorded songs for an LP album along with the Nashville Quartet and Guy Carowin. And one of these songs was This Little Light of Mine. Let's listen to them. Well, I hope we'll listen to them. There we go. Have to get the little the signal in there. I'm so glad we rehearsed. There we go. Got it. This little light of mine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, deep down in the south, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh, deep down. It's a little sample. If you listen to the Spotify list, you heard the whole thing. What cultural work does this song do? In terms of common humanity and equality, we can think of it in terms that John Lovell Jr., who's a scholar, uh, looks at it. This is one of many slave songs that affirm the intelligence of African Americans in a time when their intelligence was not considered valid. Some interpreters read the light as the human spirit or the divinity within each person. This version of this little light of mine names the light as the light of freedom, a universal desire of all people. Even the words God gave it to us, if you look over in the second column, even those words indicate there's a sense of humanity and equality for everyone. God gave it to us. In terms of emotion, I don't know about you, but there's kind of an upbeat rhythm that we've got going there. Gives the song an optimistic quality. Plus, repetition gives the singers a sense of determination, which makes this song motivational and inspirational. Thinking about community, this song is really unique in the way that it is both universal and very individual. By 1963, when SNCC published this song in their songbook, more verses further demonstrated the song's versatility. All in the jailhouse, we're gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. When movement activists sang the same songs, they created a community with each other through their common musical language. That community extended across space 
and time. Eight years after the Montgomery boycott, Southern Freedom Movement participants in Birmingham, Alabama, sang, down in Birmingham, we're gonna let it shine, they sang other freedom songs too. And they elevated gospel songs, gospel music, to a central place in that city's movement. Let's move on to Birmingham. Compared to Montgomery and Selma, with their long-standing traditions from plantation life and slavery, Birmingham was actually kind of a new city. It was incorporated in 1871. Its mining, iron, and steel production inspired one of its nicknames, the Pittsburgh of the South. A more ominous nickname, Bombingham, came from segregationists who frequently dynamited buildings, and also maimed and killed freedom movement people. Like many other cities in Alabama and across the South, Birmingham's freedom movement was a local campaign with national implications. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, wiry in stature and fiery in rhetoric, strode into Birmingham and its urban scene in 1955. Reverend Shuttlesworth organized the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, the ACMHR, and under his presidency, the ACMHR affiliated with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He survived a bomb that destroyed his home because the bomb left him without a scratch. He was even more determined to lead the freedom movement in Birmingham. Birmingham as a town, interestingly enough, had a very thriving gospel music culture. Not only did churches and schools have gospel music choirs, you might expect that, but mills and mines and other places of business had their own gospel choirs too. Now let me explain. Gospel music compared to its forerunner, the African American spiritual, has a much more modern sound. It has sort of bluesy intonations, rhythmic arrangements, fluid electric organ accompaniment, vibrant percussion, and lively interactions between soloists, excuse me, soloists and the choir. Many gospel musicians who performed nationally and internationally originated in Birmingham, Alabama. You'll also hear in a minute how gospel music influenced rhythm and blues as well as Motown. I think you'll be able to pick up on that. Reverend Shuttlesworth formed the ACMHR Gospel Choir in July of 1960. Seems only right that a movement would have a gospel choir. By 1963, he and Dr. King asked 18-year-old college student and student activist Carlton Reese to take the helm. Because of Birmingham's rich gospel tradition, they wanted the gospel choir to be a dynamic force at those mass meetings. Carlton was already a movement veteran. He had sat in at lunch counters. He had led his fellow high school students on a march. He'd been arrested. He was even bitten by a police dog in Kelly Ingram Park. If that is not a credential, I don't know what is. So he knew the movement and he knew the power of music. Looking back, Carlton said, everybody loves music. When a person is sad, he wants to find a song that makes him glad. When he gets weary, he finds a song that makes him cheer up. When you're riding along in your car and you flip on that radio and hear a song that relates to your feelings or to some kind of st story or experience that you've encountered, it brings joy to your soul. For the movement, Carlton wrote original songs and adapted other songs for the choir to sing. He even did it sometimes on the spot during a mass meeting. He explained, as Dr. King or Reverend Shuttlesworth and the other activists talked, I thought of lyrics and put the tune to them. It becomes very easy to write when you are actually involved in the situation where there is a need for it. The ACMHR Gospel Choir, also called the Birmingham Movement Choir, swelled from its 23 founding members to 60 voices during the height of the movement in 1963. At one point, 
The choir sang for 40 consecutive nights at mass meetings. And because gospel music was an established part of Birmingham culture, it assumed particular importance to the movement there. And that brings us to 99 and a half won't do. One of the favorite songs of the Birmingham, Mo Birmingham Movement Choir was 99 and a half won't do. It was a modern gospel song written by Birmingham's own gospel legend, Dorothy Love Coates. Carlton Reese adapted it for the freedom movement and arranged it for the choir and his own organ accompaniment. The words you see here on the screen come from the transcription of Carlton's arrangement, but we're going to hear a different version by Reverend F.C. Barnes. I want you to notice the interplay between Reverend Barnes and the choir and also the other aspects of gospel music that I talked about. And then you will hear the gospel music sound. in this gospel song comes from its ability to inspire. In a city where many residents hesitated to get involved in the movement because of very real risks to their jobs, to their homes, and to their lives, this song encouraged a concerted citywide effort for desegregation, and it reminded everybody involved that they had to keep going all the way. Emotionally, this music created a jubilant spirit at the mass meeting, energizing everyone there. The push of the rising numbers, 97, 98, 99, reminds singers and listeners that persistence leads to success. As a community devoted to gospel music and singing together, they were joined in these mass meetings and out on the streets in their fight to the end. During the spring of 1963, during the Birmingham movement, network TV news coverage of attack dogs and fire hoses blasting peaceful protesters in Birmingham drew national outrage and concerted effort to pass civil rights legislation. By that August, attention shifted to the peaceful March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Many Americans hoped that the violence was over. But a short 18 days after the March on Washington, all eyes returned to Birmingham, where a Sunday morning bomb blast in the 16th Street Baptist Church killed four little girls. Two boys would be killed later that day in related incidents. Those children and their families deeply experienced profound tragedy 
when racial violence was directed against innocent lives. The seismic effect of Birmingham would reach across miles to Selma and across time to 1965, when the SCLC arrived to augment the work that SNCC Freedom Fighters had been doing for the previous two years. High on a bluff above the Alabama River, Selma stands 50 miles west of Montgomery, 90 miles southwest of Birmingham. A thriving shipping center when cotton was king, Selma added banking and business to its economy in the 20th century. Eight-year-old Cheyenne Webb felt drawn to the Selma movement. She had heard Dr. King speak about freedom. She knew about the girls her age who had died in Birmingham two years before. Without her parents' knowledge initially, she skipped school and attended the organizational meetings in Brown Chapel. She sat in the back row and just watched what was going on. A high school boy saw her and he brought her up front and introduced her to SCLC staff member, Jose Williams, who asked if she could sing. I told him I could, Cheyenne explained. So we began practicing some of the freedom songs. Ain't nobody gonna turn me around. Oh, freedom, this little light of mine. I knew them all. So it was decided. I would be singing at some of the mass rallies. Cheyenne told her best friend, nine-year-old Rachel West, all about the meetings, and that she would be singing in the front of the crowd at Brown Chapel. On Sunday, January 17th, both girls put on their best dresses, tied ribbons in their hair, and they sat together in the front row. Before long, Reverend Reese announced that Cheyenne would lead them in a song. She remembers it this way. I sang and the people all joined in. After a few stanzas of ain't nobody gonna turn me around, I noticed Rachel was up there with me, beaming and singing her heart out. We would do a lot of singing together in the coming weeks. In fact, they would. And in March, they would face the anger of Sheriff Jim Clark, a determined segregationist, who led his posse men against protesters. Most of us remember those images from the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Now let's take a look at this freedom song that Cheyenne and Rachel led. Reverend Ralph Abernathy introduced Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around at a mass meeting actually during the Albany, Georgia movement in 1962. The song became popular throughout the Southern movement. Once again, a CBS camera crew filmed a national documentary that showed students clapping and singing the song as the police carried them off to paddy wagons. One vocal arrangement sounds like this. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round, turn me round, turn me round. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking. Marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let George Wallace turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let George Wallace turn me around. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Like other freedom songs, this one could easily be adapted. In Albany, Georgia, they would sing, Ain't gonna let Mayor Kelly turn me around. While in Selma, they sang about Alabama Governor George Wallace. Plus, there were universally applied verses. You can see those over on the right-hand side of the screen. Ain't gonna let no jailhouse, ain't gonna let segregation, ain't gonna let persecution, no police dogs, no fire hoses. You get the idea. In her memoir, Cheyenne expresses her understanding of what we are calling the cultural work of freedom songs. She was looking back and she explained, those songs carried a message. Freedom songs called out for justice, right now, not later. They spoke of our determination, our dignity. Some songs told of the ultimate sacrifice we were prepared to make to achieve a dream. And here Cheyenne quotes the song, Oh Freedom. 
And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. This song, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, O oh Freedom, it, both of them show hope, determination, and the humanity of African Americans. Cheyenne's friend Rachel also made an observation that seems especially relevant today. She said, there's a kinship, there's a kinship between all us black folks, a bond that tied the Montgomery bus boycott people to the Birmingham people, and finally to us here in Selma. Today we have seen and heard that singing freedom songs together helped create the communal bond that Rachel and Cheyenne and so many others experienced during the Southern Freedom Movement. Which brings us to the bottom line. Freedom fighters in Montgomery, Birmingham, and Selma all sang, as did freedom fighters throughout the South. They sang many songs in common, although different cities had their own favorites and their own styles. Um, over time, the freedom song repertoire expanded to include not only spirituals, hymns, and revised spirituals, but also gospel songs, as we've heard, popular songs, advertising jingles, parodies, blues, and rock and roll songs. Without question, activists held We Shall Overcome in its own place of honor and even sacredness. How did singing freedom songs help the movement? Singing freedom songs together affirmed the humanity of African Americans who were treated as less than human. Singing freedom songs together established equality among all people, regardless of skin color. Singing freedom songs together expressed emotions from joy to anguish, from frustration, but most importantly, to hope. Most important for my thinking is that singing freedom songs together created egalitarian resonance, a brief sense of community that modeled the beloved community, Dr. King's ultimate goal. And at this point, I think we can pause and take some um, questions. I do have a slide that has um, some things to read if you're interested and also some uh, some things to look for online to hear more about the you know, movement songs. Sarah, do we have some questions? Uh, we're going to give people a couple of seconds to type them in. First of all, I want to say thank you and also thank you for singing. You're that welcome. was great. <laughs> Wonderful. So everybody who is listening in, um, the Q&A box is down at the bottom of your screen. So if you just click there, then you can type your questions in and I will read them out loud for everyone so that everyone can hear the question and then Dr. Boots can answer it. So please go ahead and do that. Um, and please do type your questions in because um, we don't have the audio enabled. I see a couple of people are raising their hand, but please use the Q&A box if you can. Um, Cheryl, one question. You mentioned just recently, just at the end of the presentation, um, that Cheyenne Webb was eight years old when she got involved. That seems very young. Yes. Um, was that typical of the movement that you had such young participants? Um, there were young people involved all the way along. Birmingham is, is sort of noted for the conscious use of um, grade school kids and high school kids. Um, but as you can see, it happened in um, Selma as well. Um, Cheyenne was eight, um, Rachel was nine. They were the exception, but there was a point where there was a young people's march that, that they were involved in. They were also involved in the adult marchers times as well. And it's interesting because there's a, a historian, John Lovell Jr., who talks about how young slaves were in the 19th century and and particularly the young slaves were the ones that often uh, were escaping north um, and and it seems to me that we see that continue in the 20th century with the young people who who got involved SNCC was was college age people or shortly thereafter the the high school students and the kids in Birmingham and also in Selma. 
So it seems to be sort of a historical trend. Thank you. So Reggie has a question. Were the songs part of the community action slash civil disobedience plans that protesters developed or would they just spur those things? So they were very much um, planned. They would they would gather before going out uh, on, a, on an action, let's say a march that was going to um, a place to register to vote. And people would start singing there. And they knew these songs. And so they would, they would sing them as they walked out the door and, and while they were on the street. There were many times that um, people in the movement were protesting that they couldn't use lunch counters or that they couldn't go into department stores and try on clothes. Um, and so that there would be picketing going around in front of the store. And they often were singing at that point too. John Lewis talks about those kinds of events and he said it was boring when there wasn't any action. You were just walking and walking and so you wanted to do something. So spontaneously you would sing. And certainly on the Selma to Montgomery March, um, according to Pete Seeger and um, uh, Len Chandler, there were songs that, that people knew that they sang and Len Chandler, who was a singer-songwriter, even made up songs that uh, they sang as they were marching from Selma to Montgomery. Uh, we actually have a couple of people asking the same question. Um, is there a difference in how current marchers and protesters use songs? Yeah, I think they aren't singing as much. Um, we seem to be uh, in a situation where people are more inclined to do chanting. Um, and I have sort of mixed feelings about that. I did, I did publish an essay about chanting in, um, in Charlottesville and that I felt like music really had a power that chanting does not. And, and in Charlottesville, case in point, um, there were protesters there who were counter protesters to the um, Unite the Right protesters who were, who were chanting Nazi slogans and, and uh, anti-Semitic chants. And there were a bunch of protesters um, who probably were of my age or a little bit older, uh, who had known the freedom movement and they started singing this little light of mine. And they actually were able to quiet the chants of the, of the Unite the Right people who were, who were just yelling. Um, they chanted it during the, during the um, uh, freedom movement in the 1960s, you know, what do we want freedom? When do we want it now? And we hear that chant today, but there was, it was augmented by song. And I don't hear as much of that singing. Um, but I hear scattered reports that there is some music that happens. Um, we have a question here about Dr. King. Is there any song specifically associated with the events that Dr. King attended? Well, he, he, um, he had his favorites. Um, in fact, the, the night that, that he was uh, assassinated, they were planning to have uh, a mass meeting and he had asked for, and I think it was Precious Lord um, to be sung. It was one of his favorites. Um, I'm sure somebody is gonna correct me if I'm misremembering that, but um, uh, he certainly did have, have his favorites. And, and he wrote often about um, We Shall Overcome. He talked about that. Lewis asks, the song Love Train achieved prominence in the era you are describing. Did you find connection with that song to the movement? Wow, I haven't, Lewis, but if you've got something on that, let me know. Um, I love it. I, I have um, tracked, as I said, uh, advertising jingles that were sung in Parchman Prison uh, in Mississippi during the Freedom Rides that uh, happened in 1961. Um, and uh, which was really fun finding those. Um, and, I've, and I found many instances where people used popular music um, to, to sing together. Um, but I don't know the story of, of uh, what is it, Freedom Train? Uh, Love Train. Love Train. Um, I'm, sure there, I'm sure there are many stories. I just don't happen to know them. So send them on. <laughs> um. Oh, is there any Freedom Song collection that you particularly recommend? In terms of recording? Um, I think so, yes. Yeah, I've, I've, um, I've listed on the, on the slide here, Sing for Freedom, the story of the civil rights movement through its songs. Um, 
But I would also direct you to Reggie Harris's page, reggieharrismusic.com. Um, he, he also performs with uh, Kim Harris, and together they have done um, a CD almost entirely of Freedom Songs. And so that, I would say those two would be great places to start. Um, and then Dan is asking, was there any comprehensive effort made to record the voices of the original authors and singers? Have oral histories been compiled where we can explore these songs all in one place? So similar question. about Yeah, um, there are a lot of oral histories, uh, many of them at uh, various uh, universities throughout the South. Um, so any, you know, Mississippi, Georgia, North Carolina, um, those universities, you can just go online and, and you can find uh, oral histories. I've included on the on the uh, slide here the uh, www.crmvet.org.org, which has um, sort of invited people to send to, into them um, their stories, um, pictures, um, other kinds of uh, documents. That's where I, I have gone to when I was using the um, SNCC Freedom Song songbook. It's, there's a, a photocopy of that, excuse me, at the crmvet.org site. Um, yeah. So we have another um, question that's related to current events here. In Aretha Franklin's funeral, they mm. mentioned that she would specifically be asked to attend marches so she could use her voice in singing the songs. In the movie Selma, Mahalia Jackson, I believe, would inspire MLK. And then this is Reggie again. Thanks, Reggie. I believe Harry Belafonte did the same in marches. Are there other examples of popular singers who would add their voices to the movement? Oh, there are lots of them. And, and I'm so glad uh, you mentioned Harry Belafonte because um, he was critical to the movement in many, many ways. He became a very close advisor of Dr. King. Um, Dr. King would stay with, with uh, Harry Belafonte and his wife in, in New York City when he just sort of needed to get away but couldn't, couldn't go very far away or if he was needed to be in the city he would stay with them. Harry Belafonte brought plane loads of people all, all throughout the movement. If you look at footage of the um, uh, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, there you'll see all these Hollywood personalities and Harry Belafonte because he had brought them uh, there. And he also would bring New York um, people down as well. Um, so he was, he was really crucial to the movement and people adapted his songs to be freedom movement songs. So the, the um, um, one of them became freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom come and then it won't be long. You know, that's a, that's a Harry Belafonte song. So there were many. Sam Cooke was another singer who was a popular singer. He, he very much came out of that gospel music tradition um, and A Change Is Gonna Come was uh, a, a song that is really kind of haunting in terms of his uh, ability to produce it very quickly and it's a very uh, stirring song. Uh, Mary asks, what role, if any, did the song Lift Every Voice and Sing have in the freedom movement? Lift Every Voice and Sing is commonly called um, the uh, anthem, African-American anthem um, or, or freedom song. Uh, it, it certainly was part of the mix, but uh, tended to be, from my experience, more commonly sung in churches. I haven't found a whole lot of documentation of it being sung out on the um, on the sidewalks or um, in the um, places where people were were trying to desegregate facilities. It's a great question. I mean, it is it is sung, um, and it's certainly very meaningful. Uh, I think it probably was more located within the uh, church environment. These are great questions, um, and we yeah. have. Since you just sang a little bit for us again, how about this one? Can you tell us a little more about your upcoming book? And since you are also a gifted singer, will you be recording a soundtrack to accompany the text? I think that's the person that I paid 10 bucks to. to. <laughs> so thank you. I'll be, the check is in the mail. Uh, um, I'll, I'll get the name and the address from, from Sarah. It'll be fine. Um, tentatively, the, it's titled um, 
when the spirit says sing and it's about 10 years from 1955 to 1965 and the southern freedom movement so i I, I don't look at what's going on uh, up north, even though by the end of that, that time frame, there are things, very important things happening in the north. I'm staying focused in the south, um, partly because I think it's just a very rich environment and musically it was just so lush. Um, I do not plan at this point to, to uh, make a CD, but when I have a publisher, uh, if my publisher wants me to sing, I would be more than happy to do that. <laughs> That's great. We still have a couple minutes if there are any other questions. Um, Cheryl, I know for this presentation we were somewhat limited on time and also you focused your talk on the locations that BU alumni will have the opportunity to visit in October. Um, so you talked about Birmingham, Selma, and Montgomery. Are there other places, other towns, other cities that were very important to these? Oh you know, yeah, songs? yeah, and, and I, I will, um, I will start with Montgomery, but well, actually, I start um, a little bit with um, a very seminal experience for the for people. And you know, when I talk about what made 1955 different, um, the, the murder of Emmett Till in 1955 um, was was a watershed experience, and the and his mother's decision to publish those photographs. Um, and to have an open casket was um, was so profound that it affects the people who are involved in the movement. Rosa Parks in one interview said she was thinking of Emmett Till when she stayed in her seat. Um, there are, um, uh, Joyce Ladner and others talk about the fact that they were the Emmett Till generation. And if you think about it, in 1955, they were, they were about Emmett's age. And so by the 1960, when we have the first sit, well, it's not the first sit-ins, sit but the, the movement of sit-ins starts in 1960 with the North Carolina um, sit-ins that then spread. These were the generation of Emmett Till. So I started with Emmett Till in the, in the uh, introduction and then moved to the Montgomery story. Um, I also have stories and songs from the, the Freedom Riders from Parchman Jail, from, um, uh, I had really hadn't thought about it previously, but St. Augustine was an important movement, and, and there was a lot of singing that happened then. Um, I look at uh, Mississippi, the, the death of Herbert Lee, and that ballad tradition that comes out of Mississippi. Um, so I, I really look uh, all across the South in my, in my book. Thank you. And you may have mentioned this while I was um, reading the questions, but when do you anticipate the book coming out? When do I anticipate? Yeah. I, yeah, I anticipated no this pressure. year. I anticipated this year, and we saw where that went. So oh. um, um, I'm hoping in the next couple of years. So, so definitely by 2020, preferably 2019. Um, I'm still uh, investigating publishers. Um, whether it'll be an academic press or whether it might be a more general um, readership, that's still being negotiated. Great. Um, so if anyone has a last minute question, please do type it in. Um, but let me just um, tell you that we will send out the recording of this. So it will be about a week um, before I can do that, but I will email everyone the recording of this, and we will also send you the Spotify playlist. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to the songs in full, we'll send that to you. Oh, and Aaron is sneaking in one more question here. This is great. Can, we, can I do a little thank you to Dave for doing the Spotify? That was really great. Yes, our colleague Dave did the Spotify list. Thank you. Okay, Erin, she says, you've noted a difference between singing and chanting, and I'd like to hear more of your thoughts about the differences regarding the four functions you laid out for these songs. Do you see song having unique advantages on these points? Yeah, I, I think that, that um, songs have uh, a broader emotional range than chanting. Chanting tends to be either argumentative uh, or sometimes just sort of self-affirming, but I think the, those other emotional responses that we find in music um, you, you can't really get with chanting, um, at least not that I've seen in, in uh, movement footage, um, 
contemporary movement footage or the, the movement uh, events that I've been at. So I, I think that for me, that's the biggest one that the chanting tends to be argumentative. Um, singing can somehow respond to that argument without becoming violent. Um, it is it, an ultimately nonviolent response to violence. And certainly in Charlottesville is an example, we see how it turns that violence on its head. Oh, we have another one. You guys, this is great. We love the questions. Um, Reggie asks, have you heard any songs in the last 10 to 15 years and thought, wow, that would have made a great movement song? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, no, but if Reggie has some suggestions, I'd be glad to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Reggie, you have some homework here. <laughs> yeah, really. But are we at about the point, Sarah, where I can sort of finish up? Have you done the, the things that you need to do? Because I have just a little bit more that I wanted to end with. Yeah, absolutely. There's only one more thing that I wanted to say, okay. um, which is that um, if, if anyone is interested, um, we have a wonderful experience that we have planned for next month. And I sent everyone a reminder email. So you are more than welcome to reply to that email, which will come directly to me. Um, and ask about Experience Building the Dream, which will be with Dr. Fluker. Um, hopefully you've all heard about it, but we will actually be visiting all of the places that Dr. Boots mentioned in her presentation. We'll be going to Kelly Ingram Park, the 16th Street Church. We'll be going to the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Montgomery. We're going to visit the, the new museum and the new memorial that just opened in April. So um, I have a few spots left if anyone is interested and I would love for some of you to join us, for all of you to join us. Um, so please inquire with me if you're interested. You can also go to bu.edu slash alumni slash experience and you'll find all the information there. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Boots. Take it, take it away. Let me just say one thing, Dr. Fluker is fantastic. You really will have a marvelous experience, those of you who are planning to go on that trip. I recommend it completely. If we're gonna talk about music during the movement, we have to at least spend a little bit of time with We Shall Overcome, the anthem of the civil rights movement. And I just wanna make one point about it and, and then, uh, and then close because it often was used as a closing song um, when when the mass meeting was over. I mean, it was used at other times too. In fact, if you look at the footage of the March on Washington, there are several times, many, many times where people start singing, we shall overcome and, and it just blooms and, and consumes the entire audience. It was indeed called the Anthem of the Civil Rights Movement. And there's been some contention over the years, who, and who came up with it, where does it come from? And, and my way of thinking about it is that it's collective and composite in terms of its origin. Like most folk songs and most spirituals, no single individual can claim credit, but many can justifiably say they contributed to it. So this, the tune largely comes from a spiritual many thousand gone. Um, it also bears a great deal of uh, uh, musical DNA, if you will, from uh, Reverend Charles Tinley's gospel song, I'll Overcome Someday. Um, it was a labor movement song uh, that um, was heard by Zilphia Horton. She, her husband um, headed the Highlander Center and she heard the um, Negro food and tobacco workers on strike in Charleston, South Carolina in 1945, singing a song, which may well have been Louise Shropshire's song, If My Jesus Wills, but had new words to it. And so Zilphia brought the song that she heard back to Highlander. That's where Guy Carowin heard it. That's where Pete Seeger learned it. Guy taught it to the SNCC students at their first meeting. Pete sang it everywhere. And the musical Guy was cast. As we conclude, I want to um, play the version from the Spotify uh, collection, and and I have a short reading. Wyatt P. Walker was an SCLC staff member, activist, and freedom song historian. He wrote about shallow one cannot describe the vitality portion of this one song
Dr. Boots, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us. We will be in touch. And please, please feel welcome to reach out to the BU Alumni Association anytime. We love hearing from you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.